Opium it has been used for centuries as both a medicine and an often addictive recreational substance, and one empire decided to take steep advantage of it. It all began back in the 17th century, when the East India Company established budding trade relations with China. These ties would strengthen over time as the East India Company grew to dominate European trade with China and eventually led, in the mid-18th century, to the foundation of the Canton system, in which the contemporary Chinese Qing Dynasty would be able to better control the booming trade with the British. The only issue with this, though, for the Brits at least, was that the Qing Dynasty really controlled the trade relations. British merchants could only trade with a specific group of Chinese merchants. They could only use one of the 13 factories from Canton and were not allowed to learn to speak Chinese. Nonetheless, there was extremely high demand for Chinese goods over in Britain, and the trade of silk, porcelain, and tea was still flourishing. This in itself slowly became an inconvenience for the East India Company, however, given the fact that the Chinese merchants would accept only one thing in exchange for their products, silver. As a consequence, silver was leaving Britain at a rapid rate, and while they satisfied the demand for Chinese goods simultaneously, the inability to keep silver in their pockets began to bother the Brits. The solution, if you ask the East India Company, it would be opium. To be transparent, opium was not new to China when the British started to bring it. In fact, the use of the drug medicinally had begun back during the Tang Dynasty and was initially brought to China by Arab merchants. The opium trade was soon dominated by British merchants. By 1781, opium exports to China via the Brits slowly began to become a regular occurrence. Since this trade would be the British key to solving the waning silver predicament, the British East India Company quickly established tight control over the industry and ensured that opium would be traded for the necessary silver and that related payments would end up in British pockets. This plan worked for the East India Company and Great Britain, and for a while, it also worked for the Chinese. By giving more silver to the Brits, this allowed more Chinese goods to be sold to Britain in return, and the profitable cycle could continue. That was, however, only until the opium itself became a problem for the Qing authorities. Opium being an often addictive drug was creating a subsequent society of addicts, which began to destabilize the Chinese society. By 1799, the government had both banned the drug and put an end to the trade of it. The British merchants, however, were not willing to give up the solution that they had so happily found to the silver debacle. Unbothered by the bans, they continued to smuggle opium into China under the noses of the officials to then sell it to Chinese opium dealers. The trade thus continued and even flourished, especially as more European and American merchants decided to join the industry. Eventually, the Qing authorities began to seriously crack down on both the opium trade and British trade and monopoly as a whole. This angered the British merchants and sparked a new wave of tensions between Britain and China. The discord continued to escalate as both sides wanted to hold their ground, and the final straw soon came in the mid-19th century, when the Chinese officials began to seize British opium for destruction. A few skirmishes broke out in response, until finally the decision was made to go to war. The mindset of the British was simple. This was not a normal war. It was a punitive expedition, and the Chinese would face consequences for their attack on British trade. The Chinese, on the flip side, were not quite as prepared, since they did not expect the Brits to return after their previous skirmishes. Nevertheless, in the early summer of 1840, the first wave of British forces returned to China and demanded that the Qing authorities pay compensation for all the destroyed goods they had seized and additional damage done by the interference with British trade. Predictably, the Qing officials refused to do so. The Brits now resorted to Plan B. Through a coalition of naval and ground forces, the British then took the region of Dinghai on the Zhaoshan Island and were able to force brief negotiations with the Qing government, although this failed to resolve the conflict and the war continued. 
The Second Battle of Chun Pi in January of 1841 ended in favor of the Brits, and the Chinese attempted to make peace once again out of concern for their own ability, or lack of, to win the war. The Convention of Chun Po was written up in hopes of doing just that, but both governments simultaneously refused to sign the document, and henceforth continued the war. The British swiftly seized more Qing territory with the Battle of the Bogue and the Battle of First Bar that February, riding on their increasing wave of momentum for the months to come. The Qing administration still fought back as mightily as they could, but so far, it seems that nothing could stop the British war machine. One remarkable moment of aggression came in March, when the Brits had decided to consider negotiation with the Chinese government and sent a ship under the flag of truce, which the Qing shortly fired upon. In response, the stunned Brits targeted the fort at fault and set it ablaze. On March 18th, the British attacked and partially occupied Canton, finally reopening trade for British merchants after negotiating with the Chinese Kohong merchants. Two days later, though, a truce was declared and the Brits partially withdrew. After a failed night attack by the Qing troops in May, attempting to exterminate the Brits from the city of Canton, and by May 30th, all of Canton consequently fell under British authority. The following day, a treaty was signed between the local leadership and the Brits, which prompted the latter to withdraw further back to the Bogue forts. The war dragged on for months more, and the British luck began to change slightly. In two incidents, British ships were wrecked and survivors of the accidents were taken hostage and many later executed or killed by neglect in what would be named the Nair Buddha incident. Still, the tide soon favored the Brits again with the second capture of Chu San and the seizure of a Ningbo fort a few days later, followed shortly by the occupation of the entire city. A short break in the war came now with the winter of 1841, but by the following March, the conflict was back on with the British victory at the Battle of Ningpo and the immediate capture of the city of Sishi. More and more battles broke out, and the British troops again and again came out triumphant, though still, the Qing authorities were not ready to give in. Thanks to the stubborn strength of the Chinese, the war raged on until August of 1842, when the Qing government at last decided to negotiate peace with the British once more. Weeks of diplomatic talks were required for the two sides to finally come to any kind of satisfactory agreement, but eventually, on August 29, 1842, the Treaty of Nanking was signed on the HMS Cornwallis and officially ended the First Opium War. The terms of the treaty greatly changed the former Canton system for foreign trade in China in favor of the British merchants, which helped resolve the initial tensions that had built up to the point of the war. Additionally, the Qing authorities were to pay six million silver dollars in compensation to the Brits for the stolen opium and millions more for other reparations demanded by the British. All British prisoners of war were further released by the Chinese officials, and all Chinese citizens who had assisted the British efforts were to be granted amnesty. Few similar terms were forced on by the Brits. Contrarily, and lastly, Hong Kong seceded to the British crown as a new crown colony. A later treaty, known as the Treaty of the Bogue, was then signed the following year and saw the Qing government recognize Britain as an equal to China, and another year later, Comparable treaties would be signed between the Qing and the United States and the Qing and France. Although it would take less than two decades for the Second Opium War to break out nonetheless, the end of the First Opium War closed the door on a strange few years in history and put an end to the trade conflict between the British and Chinese, even if only temporarily. The end of the First Opium War was supposed to bring about easier trade for Britain and China new rights for British citizens, and the cession of Hong Kong to the British Empire. In reality, only some of this happened as it was intended to, and as the name itself implies, this would not be the only Opium War. By the 1850s, Britain had been attempting to gain even more influence and privileges within China, and aimed to take full advantage of their possession of Hong Kong. As part of this strategy, the British began to grant registration for some of the Chinese-operated ships in Hong Kong, 
with one of those vessels being the Arrow. Formerly a pirate ship, the Arrow had since been resold and registered in Hong Kong by the British, and subsequently flew a British flag, though it was still operated by a Chinese crew. When the Chinese authorities in Canton saw the ship in the fall of 1856, they seized it under the claim that they believed it was still being used for piracy, in spite of the British flag in clear sight. This, of course, angered the Brits. While the Chinese officials would eventually decide to release the crew, it wasn't enough to satisfy Britain's consul to China, Harry Parks, who was ready to declare war on the Chinese. This was with a disregard for the British Parliament's objection to a war. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister would soon join Parks' side. As a result, the British launched an attack on Canton from the Pearl River. As relations between Britain and China crumbled, the governor of Canton was captured by the Brits and sent to their Indian colony, and trading between the nations came to a total halt. With Canton within its grasp, Britain looked to push further as war became a guarantee. By now, Britain's Prime Minister Lord Palmerstone was all in favor of officially launching a second opium war. When Parliament voted against such a daring endeavor, the Prime Minister ensured that the following general election swung in his favor as to ensure the support of his desired battle. Thus, pushing dissenting parliamentarians aside, Lord Palmerstone locked his nation in another war with China. And Britain wasn't alone now given that the French had also developed a growing feud with China and hopes to gain from the conflict. A new alliance was formed between the famed enemies, France and Britain, but the other notable powers, Russia and the United States, opted to remain more or less neutral. So with just France and Britain taking up arms side by side, the situation ramped up in the spring of 1858. The Allied's naval vessels reached Tianjin by May and began to harass the Chinese coast, fairly quickly pushing the latter into peace negotiations. By June of the same year, the treaties of Tianjin were signed by the Chinese Qing Dynasty, British Empire, Russia, France, and the United States. This was a series of agreements that were meant to end the war altogether but in reality would only put a pause on the hostilities. The treaty had a few main goals, ranging from opening up travel by foreigners into previously closed off regions of China, to the opening of almost a dozen more ports to the Western nations, even to the establishment of Western legations in Peking. China additionally owed millions of tales of silver to both belligerent nations of Britain and France, and yet, this would not be enough to satisfy either Western power. The first signs of renewed warfare came only a year after the 1858 series of treaties, when a dispute between Chinese defenders at the Taku forts and a British naval fleet turned violent. The latter was made up of 2,200 troops spread over 21 ships and was escorting the new envoys from France and Britain who needed to be brought to Beijing. Upon arriving in front of the Taku forts, Admiral Sir James Hope demanded that his fleet be allowed to pass so they may escort the envoys on their way. This was denied despite British insistence, and the fleet was told instead to land at Bay Tang and escort the envoys inland from there. Sir James Hope refused to agree. Subsequently, in the thick of the summer night, British troops blew up Chinese blockades in the Bai He River in preparation for their continuation. They next began shelling the forts and tried to sail on, but were ultimately repelled by the Taku defenders. Even so, the following year would renew hostilities at the Taku forts. This time, the Allied French and British troops did land at Bay Tang at the end of July and launched their offensive a few days later. The fight would not be easy, and after the Allied forces took out the fort's artillery, combat became increasingly intense. 
The British and French troops eventually forced their way into the first fort, and battle here alone raged on for over three hours before the defenders had all been eradicated. The Allied troops took over 100 casualties as well, but their victory here prompted one of the forts to the south to call for a ceasefire. The plea for peace was nevertheless ignored, and the Brits and French marched along to the second northern fort instead. Despite worsening weather conditions, the Allied forces once more were triumphant and captured the second of the set of four forts. Seeing these developments and knowing that they would be unable to protect themselves, the remaining defenders thus surrendered. By now, the Chinese leadership realized that they had more or less run out of options for defeating the British and their allies. Knowing that the war would never end in their favor, they opted to re-enter negotiations, even if it meant signing another one of the so-called unequal treaties. After defeating the Taku forts, the Western allies had marched next to Zheng Jiwan, where they clashed with a roughly 30,000 strong Chinese force. This ended in an allied victory and was followed only a few days later by the Battle of Palikao. This clash ended with the Western forces routing the Chinese and marching on into Beijing. To the horror of the Chinese authorities and Qing dynasty, the Allied troops plundered the Summer Palace and Winter Palace, hammering the final nail in the coffin of China's hopes for triumph. Finally, the Convention of Peking would end the brutal war with a series of three new treaties. The agreements were made not just between China, Britain, and France, but also with the United States and the Russian Empire. Yet again, this convention was seen as unfair to China, but given the circumstances, there wasn't much that the Chinese officials could do. Once more, they were pushed into ceding territory to Britain, as well as some to Russia. The previously signed treaties were also ratified, and China held accountable for them, among other things. It was said that, beyond a doubt, by 1860, the ancient civilization that was China had been thoroughly defeated and humiliated by the West. But there was one other factor that, this time, took more of a back seat in the war. Opium. In the First Opium War a couple decades earlier, the main issue between China and Britain had been the matter of Britain's opium trade into China. The latter, growing intolerant of the highly addictive drug being imported into China and additionally leading to a trade imbalance, seized Britain's opium stocks at Canton after banning the product's trade. Britain, of course, would not accept such terms nor threats, and thus the First War began. The second time around, though, opium trade was actually put a bit on the back burner. The main point of strain was mutual dissatisfaction with the prior treaties which had ended the First War. But this did also include British frustration with China's failure to legalize the opium trade. The Second Opium War would eventually change this and reopen legal opium trade into China for the Brits, which in more ways than just militarily made the conflict a success for the Western Allies. Still, overall, the war's purpose was to increase open trade for Western nations into China, with legalizing the already continued opium trade as a nice bonus. At the end of the day, the British and French allies were able to essentially bully the Chinese government into accepting their desired terms. The defeat in the war was also seen as deeply embarrassing for China, although not everyone was on the side of the West. In fact, one particularly important man over in Britain had quite a bit to say about the matter. William Ewart Gladstone, a parliamentarian who would later become Prime Minister himself, was horrified by Lord Palmerstone's wars over opium trade. After witnessing the damage the drug could inflict with the use of it by his own sister, Gladstone found even the basic act of trading opium into China to be despicable and inexcusable. A war more calculated in its progress to cover this country with permanent disgrace 
was how Gladstone described what he often labeled Palmerstone's Opium War, blaming the eager-for-conflict contemporary Prime Minister for the judgments of God upon England the parliamentarian feared would come.